promoting a healthy environment. It's the air we breathe. Clean, safe water. Responsible management of our natural resources. We protect and restore for a sustainable future. Environment matters. As far as an environmental bang for the buck, this is probably, in my opinion, the most beneficial endeavor that the state's ever taken on. A stream restoration program that's bringing dead streams affected by acid mine drainage back to life is getting ready to expand. Plus, I enjoy this area here. I hate to see it go to uh, a trashy environment, so we always try to clean it up and make it look better. Volunteers are the backbone of many of the DDP's cleanup efforts, and this year's annual Kanawha River Sweep is no different. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Environment Matters. I'm Greg Adolfson. And I'm Kelly Gillenwater. But first, a $1 million grant will fund stream cleanup efforts in three West Virginia counties hit hard by layoffs in the coal mining industry. Governor Earl Ray Tomlin, accompanied by DEP Cabinet Secretary Randy Huffman, made the announcement at the Ralph R. Willis Career and Technical Center in Logan on September 23rd. The grant will fund projects in Boone, Logan, and Mingo counties and will provide a way for displaced workers to continue to live and work in southern West Virginia. I'm, I'm just very pleased that uh, you know, to be able to, to bring this, along with Randy today, make this announcement of the uh, you know, million dollars and, and what that will do, but not only go to, toward paying salaries, but also any to dispose, to pay the, the dumping fees and everything, the hauling fees to get whatever litter and tires or whatever cleaned up, but get it disposed of properly. And I think that, you know, another year from now, it's a one-year grant. But I think that you know, by the end of next year, our streams and our communities should look a whole lot cleaner. We're just real privileged and we uh, look forward to this opportunity. Hopefully you'll see a lot of these workers out in these three counties in the months ahead, work year round, good weather, bad weather. And I gotta tell you that my experience with this Logan County, Mingo, Boone County workforce that we've had through this project, they are some of the hardest workers in, that I've ever seen. These guys and ladies and men, uh, many of them laid off miners, just some of the nicest, hardest working people. So we're just excited to, to be a part of this project moving forward. You know what we like in our area? Garbage. If we would just quit it, Smoky Mountains ain't got nothing on us. I'll tell you. I am from Gilbert. I was, I've been born and raised in Mingo County all my life. I'm proud of our county. I'm proud of Logan County, proud of Boone County. This is my area and this is my home. And I hope to make it look 100% better when we're done. Okay. The one year, $1 million grant to the Human Resource Development Foundation will put at least 30 displaced coal miners in Boone, Mingo, and Logan counties back to work. They'll be clearing trash and debris from the Guyandot River watershed, helping not only our environment, but also helping to boost tourism and West Virginia's overall economy. It's a win-win. It was another successful year for the DEP's annual Canal River Sweep. Volunteers tackled cleanups at sites along the length of the river, and it's those volunteer efforts that make large-scale cleanups like this possible. The DEP's Mike Huff has more. It's early Saturday morning, but instead of sleeping in, dozens of volunteers have gathered just below the Winfield Locks and Dam for a date with debris. Known locally as Winfield Beach, it's a popular spot for fishing and just hanging out on the river, but that popularity and easy access is also what makes it something of a dumping ground. Some stuff is from probably flooding that come down the river, and some stuff is it what people leave behind and just be on themselves. Uh, uh, like chicken liver, uh, things that they should know, the cleanup know better, and other stuff is just from that you can't help with from the river flooding. But uh, some, most of it is just from people leaving stuff behind, and that that upsets me. That's a common sentiment from volunteers, especially the ones who work the cleanup year after year. But most, like Corey, say they don't let the frustration get to them. This is my third year doing this, and I always enjoy coming out and clean up the environment. I enjoy this area here. I hate to see it go to. Uh, a trashy environment, so we always try to clean it up and make it look better for the community. 
The Winfield site is just one of several cleanup spots along the Kanawha, from Glen Ferris to Point Pleasant where it joins the Ohio. This year, at this site at least, there seemed to be a little bit more trash to pick up than usual, possibly due to the high water events earlier this year that tend to bring more debris into the river from flooded banks. It seems to be um, a lot of glass um, and also styrofoam that's been broken up, which can be very harmful to the environment and the water. That's a lot different from the early years of the sweep, when volunteers tended to find larger items. Think abandoned cars and barrels. These days, the largest single item seems to be tires. It makes me think that we're, we're not doing a very good job with uh, getting the word out that trash and, and litter is not good for the environment and it can, it can contaminate not only the soil but also the water and cause uh, some major reactions with the fish and, and we don't want that to happen. I teach environmental science and this is a big part of what I, what I believe is, is we've got to take care of the earth and uh, that's, a, that's a big deal to me. Last year's cleanup collected more than two tons of trash and about two dozen tires. This year, at Winfield alone, the take was around 50 bags of trash rounded up, along with about 10 tires. The DEP's REAP program supplies bags and gloves for the volunteers and arranges for the trash to be picked up and hauled away for disposal or recycling. I think it's very good. I was expecting it to be a lot more dirty, but we're getting it cleaned up. Volunteers also receive a t-shirt for their efforts, along with a big thank you from the organizers. In Putnam County, I'm Mike Huff, for Environment Matters. Organizers at the Winfield site tell us that a woman visiting from out of state saw everyone gathered together before the event started and asked, what was going on? When they told her, she said, give me a bag and point me in the direction. You have a beautiful state and I want to help. Wow. High water from this past spring and summer's flooding had created trash jams on several area rivers and streams. As the waters lift trash and debris from along the banks, it gets caught in tree branches and submerged logs, eventually forming thick mats of garbage that have to be pulled apart one piece at a time. This site on the Coal River near St. Albans is typical of the type of trash jams crews are encountering. It's also a popular spot for paddlers who float the Coal River to put in and take out. So clearing it away so that boaters can safely launch their canoes and kayaks made this cleanup a priority. All the little floating stuff tends to catch in, in these like log jam type places like this. So we're, we're gonna try to break it up and try to open it up so they don't jam back in there again and hopefully it'll keep it flowing. Crews from the DEP's REAP program worked with contractors using canoes to reach into the center of the pile and pick it apart. They used a grappling hook attached to a winch to pull apart the logs and submerged trees that were holding the pile together. It's the only way to break up piles like this. If, if not, all you can do is kind of pick the stuff off the top of it. This way we'll make sure we get all the trash out of there. And when we're done, it'll be just like an open channel there again. You won't have that whole big jam there. Everything will just flow on through. Of course, everything doesn't make it into the canoe, but other members of the cleanup crew are stationed downstream with poles to catch anything that makes it past the first line of defense, and they bag it up for disposal. Our friends at Orsanco are already making preparations for next year's Ohio River Sweep. The one-day cleanup every June covers more than 3,000 miles of shoreline in six states, including West Virginia. The DEP coordinates the cleanup efforts here. In addition to the cleanup, Orsanco also holds a poster contest for students in K-12 through to help publicize the event. The contest is open to students and counties bordering the Ohio River and its tributaries. Entries should focus on encouraging volunteer participation in the cleanup and reflect the positive outcome of raising pollution awareness. Students need to submit their artwork by mid-December. Judging takes place in January and the winners will be announced next spring. Prizes are awarded, including two $500 cash awards for the top two winners. You can find out more details and get a poster contest entry form by visiting their website or sanco.org. Orsanco is the Ohio River Valley Water Sanitation Commission, which was established in 1948 to control and abate pollution in the Ohio River Basin. The West Virginia DEP is a partner organization. 
Acid mine drainage from abandoned coal mines dating back to the 19th century is one of the leading causes of water pollution in the Mid-Atlantic region. Some of the affected streams have been devoid of aquatic life for decades, but a DEP treatment program is showing some remarkable results. The DEP's Jake Glantz joins us now with this month's cover story. Well, Kelly and Greg, the program has successfully treated about 100 miles of impacted streams, and while that's good news, Program managers will tell you there's still a lot of work ahead. The water's acidic, and it's so acidic that uh, fish can't live in it, uh, bugs can't live in it, and so we're, we're basically just raising the alkalinity to, to achieve a, a neutral pH, which is uh, near seven, and uh, that's good for the, the stream benthics and the, and the fish, macro invertebrates, everything. It's a pretty neat trick coming back from the dead, but for about 100 miles of West Virginia streams choked out by the acid mine drainage from abandoned mines dating back to the 19th century, that's exactly what happened. It's thanks to a process called limestone dosing. With an active machine like these, basically an overshot water wheel uh, developed hundreds of years ago, and uh, we take a, capture a part, portion of the stream run it through the, the building and uh, the water power actually turns the wheel. It's connected by a chain drive to a, a gearbox and that turns a worm drive auger that dispenses the chemical. We're using calcium oxide in these machines. Um, it, it just uh, puts a little bit in the water at a time and then that goes out of the building and back into the main stream and, and treats everything. It's, it's pretty basic really. What I do is I, I grab samples downstream to see what, what uh, results I'm getting. Um, then I come up and use a stopwatch to time the revolutions per minute that the, the uh, machine is turning. If my pH is, is below a 7.0, then I uh, just try to figure out how much it needs to be increased to get it to 7. If it's uh, say it's an eight, you know, it's too high, then I, I do the same thing in reverse and try to slow it down so that I achieve a seven. Um, I, I come out here three times a week generally. If everything's working correctly, um, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. To understand how it works requires a quick lesson in chemistry and geology. Acid mine drainage is formed when the water comes in contact with pyritic materials like iron sulfate found in the layers of shale located around the coal seam. Exposing this sulfur-bearing material to air and water causes a chemical reaction that creates an acidic solution. It also causes the iron and other metals to precipitate out, leaving behind the characteristic red, orange, and yellow sediments found in the bottoms of affected streams. Uh, unfortunately, the geology in northern West Virginia produces much more uh, acid mine drainage than what you see in the southern coal fields or the southern uh, coal counties. The, uh, the southern coal counties, um, they do have mine drainage problems associated with the coal seams, but not nearly to the degree uh, that you see in northern West Virginia. The, uh, the northern seams are, are much worse uh, when it comes to producing acid mine drainage. The DEP has dosing stations on several northern West Virginia streams. This one on Abram Creek in Mineral County helps to reduce a significant source of acid mine pollution on the North Fork of the Potomac River. So the dosing program actually started in the late 90s with the, uh, the limestone drum station in Canaan Valley on the Blackwater River. Uh, since then, that, that initial program has evolved into what we see today, which is uh, dosers located on various streams across northern West Virginia. Um, many of them are operating in, in a watershed type approach where you've got multiple dosers on tributaries, treating those tributaries with the intent of reviving the main stem of that particular watershed. That approach is what's working in Three Fort Creek in Taylor and Preston counties, where mining activity in the watershed dates back to the mid 1800s. Those abandoned mines left roughly 9,100 acres of untreated mine pools discharging into its headwater tributaries and leaving Three Four Creek essentially dead, lifeless, except for a few tolerant insect species. A fish survey in 2009 found 
just one fish in the entire survey area of the creek. A second survey, about a year after dosing stations were installed in the watershed, produced an entirely different result. More than 1,600 fish, including 21 different species. I'm amazed and it's, it's just wonderful. I mean, people haven't seen fish in here for a long time and so it's pretty crazy. Um, a lot near the mouth have migrated in from the river mm -hmm. and some of the bigger fish, the bass and, and sauger have migrated up pretty far. Uh, a lot of the little stuff I was kind of expecting, maybe we would see some of that, but, but we've had some pretty good sized fish. Uh, this is a large stonefly. It's the largest stonefly that we have in, in West Virginia. Generally it occupies the small headwater streams. It's, it's a sensitive organism, requires a lot of dissolved oxygen, and generally uh, it requires streams that are fairly cool. That tells me the water quality is getting a lot better than it was before. Uh, I think before in 2009 we got mostly tolerant midges and maybe a helgramite and, and a caddisfly or two. The fact that this guy's here is, uh, is really amazing and I'm, I'm surprised to find it. Just, you know, take a look at this stream and it used to run orange and sometimes whitish with nothing living in it and, and, you know, look at it now. It's really low, but it's full of life. That was in 2012. In two surveys since then, the populations have remained stable, a sure sign that the dosing is working. But the underlying problem of acid mine drainage generally doesn't go away on its own. For these streams to remain able to support aquatic life, the dosing must continue indefinitely. And the cost of recovery isn't cheap. On average, it costs the DEP about $750,000 a year to operate and maintain all the dosers in the state. The money comes from interest earned on the DEP's abandoned mine lands set-aside account. As time goes on, we hope to add additional dosers throughout northern West Virginia to try and tackle the, the miles and miles of streams that are currently dead due to AMD. Uh, if, if you look across the state, we've got uh, over a thousand miles of impaired streams due to mine drainage, and our dosers allow us to, to neutralize um, those sections of stream. Now, uh, we, we haven't come close to neutralizing all of the encoded streams, but if you look at the combination of the projects that we currently have, we've, we've neutralized uh, almost 100 miles of stream that was previously uh, dead through uh, heavy metal and uh, pH problems. As far as an environmental bang for the buck, this is probably, in my opinion, the most beneficial endeavor that the state's ever taken on. The intent of the DEP's set-aside program is to not place any type of financial burden on future generations. So as long as the principal can continue to earn more interest than what the operation and maintenance costs from the dosing program are, the DEP will be able to fund these treatment sites without placing any kind of financial burden on the taxpayers and citizens of West Virginia. For Environment Matters, I'm Jake Glantz. Thanks, Jake. One of the program's biggest successes is on the Blackwater River, which is now one of the state's better trout fisheries. In fact, conditions on the Blackwater have improved so much, thanks to additional mitigation efforts upstream, this past year the dosing stations there have been able to be taken offline. Freeing up the money from that operation has allowed the DEP's Office of Abandoned Mine Lands and Reclamation to expand the program to other streams. That's right. The DEP just finished a successful two-month trial run on Roaring Creek in Randolph County. It's a five-mile stretch from Colton to the mouth of Roaring Creek that's been dead for the last 50 or 60 years. Right now, the project is in the design phase. The DEP hopes to install a permanent dozing station in the spring of 2017. If they're successful in bringing that section back to life, it will connect to large tributaries upstream that already support native brook trout. Fall is here and the kids are back in school, but that doesn't mean all of the learning takes place inside the classroom. The DEP's Project WET holds several water festivals around the state each year to give students a chance at some hands-on learning to help preserve our most valuable resource. The DEP's Brianna Hickman has more. Greg and Kelly, for many grade school students, water is something that comes out of the tap. The goal of the program is to provide a deeper understanding, all while having some fun, too. They come from schools across Kanawha County, 
Today's Waterfest is being held at the State Capitol Complex in Charleston. They learn all different aspects about water, such as um, the chemical properties, the physical properties, how to conserve water, what animals live in the water and use it. Um, so it's a really great educational, hands-on event. For many of these students, getting to see what lives in the water is a first. So maybe they have seen um, mac macroinvertebrates before, or maybe they haven't. So sometimes uh, we introduce them to things that they have never seen in a classroom. Um, they get to experience it firsthand and actually touch the animals, and so I think it really sends a message home to them. And that's the main purpose of these events, sending that message home. Oh, we think that's very important, and that's the main reason that we do these, is to try to you know, get them thinking about water at a young age and realizing how important it is, um, that it's a resource that they need to protect. So we're hoping that this kind of stays with them as they advance through you know, their um, grade levels and always kind of remember that and maybe turn off the faucet while they're brushing their teeth or maybe when they see trash out in a river, they will pick it up and feel a little bit responsible for that water resource that we have here. But it's not all work and no play. Having fun while learning is what makes these events so effective as a teaching tool. We plan on getting them wet and grossing them out and <laughs> Uh, you know, give, we're also providing them with um, fresh water to drink so they can realize it's also something that we drink and use on hot days. Um, but we have them doing all kinds of things, running around being goofy, being loud, um, pretending to be macroinvertebrates and trying to find a good ecosystem. Uh, they are participating in a stormwater obstacle course where they have to go through and clean up stormwater pollution. Uh, they're also just making bubbles and talking about that. So we have a lot of great activities here um, to kind of send a message home, hopefully reach out to each kid. Project Wet Water Festivals are aimed at fourth and fifth graders and are part of a nationwide effort to raise awareness of the critical need for water education. The DEP also partners with the National Park Service, the Army Corps of Engineers, and local watershed organizations to help get the message out. For Environment Matters, I'm Brianna Hickman. For more information on the DEP's Project WET program, visit our website, dep.wv.gov. What a difference a year makes. Last summer, large stretches of the Ohio River were covered with a mat of blue-green algae. First reported in late August of last year, the presence of the toxic blue-green algae created what's called a harmful algal bloom, leading health officials to issue advisories to avoid contact with the river. While water temperatures remain high this year, other factors including high water flows from increased rain within the Ohio River Basin this summer make conditions less favorable for large algal blooms. One possible sighting was reported near Weirton this past August, but investigators found no evidence of a harmful algal bloom in the vicinity. Orsanko staff completed the installation this summer of a continuous monitoring station at the Pike Island Locks and Dam near Wheeling to help better predict and understand the future occurrence of Ohio River algal blooms. It's a recycling drive of a different sort. No bottles or cans or newspapers this time. Organizers were collecting latex paint. The Habitat for Humanity Restore here in Charleston held its annual latex paint drive recently at DEP headquarters in Charleston. And once again, we collected dozens and dozens and dozens of cans of paint of all colors. The Restore actually takes the latex paint, separates it out into similar colors, then strains it and remixes it, and then sells it to the public at a much reduced price. It's very popular with do-it-yourselfers on a budget and an important source of income for the Restore. It's incredibly vital. Our store is donated building materials and furniture and home goods, so you never know quite what is going to be in there. Um, we do um, have a paint, pro the paint program, now that we actually know almost year round we're going to have paint due to things like this, is becoming one of those things that you know is going to be in there, which you never really know when dealing with donate, uh, donated materials. So having a steady supply of paint has become very vital to us and enabled us to be able to ha um, have a product that they know they're going to find year round. So we have this paint drive every year, it's our fourth annual, to refill those stocks. We couldn't get through the winter without these paint drives and through help of people like the DEP, you guys really helped us make it a really large success over the past couple of years. And if you missed this most recent paint drive, don't worry. The Restore accepts latex paint at either location. You can drop it off anytime. And recycling is the most environmentally responsible way to dispose of unused latex paint. Last year, the DEP collected over 4,000 pounds of unwanted paint for recycling. We leave you now at Sandstone Falls on the New River. 
On behalf of all of us at the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. More than 800 people with one mission, promoting a healthy environment. We are the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection.